So good afternoon. Um, Tim, thanks very much for joining us. Um, Ferguson Partners have been running a podcast series for the last little while out of the States and um, more recently out of Europe. But you, uh, you have the pleasure of being the inaugural Asia Pack uh, guest on uh, Ferguson's Masterminds Lessons in Leadership. Uh, which is the title we've given this series of podcasts. Um, so thank you for that. I think um, anyone watching in Australia in real estate is going to know pretty well who you are, Tim. Uh, you've been an overarching presence in real estate for as long as I've been here. Um, and... It's probably worth just giving a brief bio of what you've done and where you've been and where you are now, and then perhaps we can cut into um, the chase on, on how you got there, etc. cetera. Um, so Tim Church is the Managing Director, Chairman, and Co-Head of Investment Banking Australia for Morgan Stanley. As Chairman and Co-Head of Investment Banking Australia, Tim's responsible for leading Morgan Stanley's client coverage function across the entire investment banking division, um, client franchises by partnering with senior coverage bankers on their clients and board efforts. Tim's also focused on advising real estate clients on capital markets, M&A, and direct real estate transactions. And he has over 25 years experience advising major Australian companies on both um, their capital and M&A needs. Prior to joining Morgan Stanley, Tim spent 11 years with UBS as head of real estate investment banking Australia, as well as working at JP Morgan for five years, Goldman Sachs, JB Weir for eight years. So Tim's been involved, he tells me, in raising over 40 billion Aussie uh, of new capital in the A-REIT sector, including a wide range of IPOs and equity raisings. And he's also advised on major real estate M&A transactions, including Crown Resorts, takeover by Blackstone, Westfield's $33 billion takeover by Univale Rodamco, and Federation Sensors' $11 billion merger with Novian Property Group. In addition to a large number of listed entities, Tim has also been involved in over $18 billion of real estate trade sales and sale and leaseback transactions. Perhaps an area we will get into shortly is that prior to his role within investment banking, Tim built up over a decade's experience in direct property. Eight years were spent with CBREs as an associate director of valuations, where Tim valued many of Australia's largest investment properties and portfolios. So an area you and I share in, uh, in our early days. Um, yeah. Tim, as I think I've mentioned, and I'll let you talk in a minute and I'll shut up, but um, there are a few things we try and cover during the course of this podcast. Firstly, understand a little bit about how you ended up where you are today, the path you walked. Secondly, as the title suggests, perhaps hearing lessons you might have learned along the way, seminal moments in your career, perhaps. Um, third, the state of the market today. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on what is a, a very interesting time in the market. And then perhaps as a wrap-up, look at how you see things perhaps in the future for the guys and girls coming up through the ranks today and how things might be different for them. So um, let, me, let me start by throwing to you to say, how does, a, how does a Swan Hill boy, a Victorian cadet valuer, a vocal Collingwood supporter, get to be one of the most dominant figures in Australian real estate? Yeah, well, thanks for that, Matt, and thanks for that very uh, kind introduction and, and the opportunity uh, to be part of the Ferguson Partners podcast series. Um, well, I can tell you for the audience, uh, most of these grey hairs uh, on my head have not been caused by being in investment banking and real estate markets for uh, the best part of almost uh, 40 years. It's probably coming from barracking for Collingwood. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a great football team that's been in more grand finals than anyone else, but uh, 44 of them, in fact, but only won 15. Uh, but they are a great team to barrack for. So, and I think that's a, 
that gives a bit of a lead into uh, having lifelong passions and certainly Collingwood Football Club's one of them, but so is real estate and so is looking after a team of people uh, that can deliver great outcomes that really, uh, if you're going to ask how did he end up here, that's probably it. It's by having great team members that have assisted me and assisted our clients. So, you know, we have a saying in AFL, uh, the champion team will always beat the team of champions. And that goes to, you know, diversity, probably exactly what Ferguson partners look to do when they get a candidate. Um, Are they a good team player? I don't think there's any industry, whether it's investment banking, uh, making widgets, uh, doing a whole range of different things where being a team player is probably one of the most valuable attributes you can have. So, look, it's been a great journey for me. I've, uh, you know, I walk, uh, walk into work each day in foods. That doesn't mean every day is an easy day, um, but I genuinely come to work loving what I do. And a lot of that uh, is having great experience. Uh, I mean, there's no question, the older you get, um, I think the better you get. And I think, you know, you've alluded to it, Matt, in difficult times, it's, it's really important um, to have sage advice going to our clients. And that only comes through from being through cycles. And, you know, cycles, uh, we've had a long period, you know, I call it in, in real estate, where we've had uh, the Reserve Bank governors over the years cutting interest rates from very high levels as they were when we took out our first mortgage when I was married, when I met my wife and got married, um, which was a long time ago. Interest rates were seventeen and a half percent. Remember it? Um, very painful. Yeah. yeah, very painful. And yeah, lo and behold, with the onset of the pandemic, central banks around the world moved to 0.1 of a percent or zero in some instances. In fact, we've seen negative rates in some of the European countries. So I've called that a period of downhill skiing. Um, and we've been downhill skiing for a long time. Um, that's actually pretty easy to get things to work when you've got near zero interest rates. But of course, we all know what's happened. We're normalising now. Um, we're at the bottom of the chairlift. Our skis are off, the chairlift stopped, and we're walking up that slippery slope, but it's hard work. Um, I see that as an opportunity. So, you know, it has been a long journey. As you said, I started in direct real estate uh, as a valuer or as a chartered surveyor, as you would know it from your mm-hmm. English days, uh, appraiser if we're talking to my US colleagues. And that was a great foundation to understanding real estate as an asset class that I've used as a core of experience as I transition from direct real estate into listed real estate. And yeah, and that, that journey you know, started um, over 25 years ago that I moved out of direct property. Uh, but it was a time when Australia was securitizing its real estate. So the, a lot of the valuations I was doing back then were for IPOs. And it was those IPO valuations that actually got me into investment banking. First in research, where I was in charge of REIT research, But very shortly thereafter, we had a spate of IPOs and the firm I was working for had no real real estate expertise in investment banking. And I made that transition into IB about 26 years ago. Uh, And it's been a very fruitful, you know, real estate investment banking has been one of the most productive areas because Australians love real estate. As I said, we've got the most securitized real estate market in the world. And with the various cycles, which I'm sure we're going to talk about later on, um, we've had a lot of activity to do it, you know, whether it was the GFC with the recapitalizations, rescue rights issues, the rebirthing of the sector with new IPOs. It's been a really productive area. So it's been an enormous amount of fun. I remember clearly uh, a Property Council Congress in the mid-90s where I think uh, John Carter was talking. And... um, he made a statement about the sector potentially getting to 30 billion at some point in the future, and everyone almost fell off their chair laughing at how ridiculous that prospect might be. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah. come a long way, as you say. It's been a busy period. It has. So did that move from valuation into, into investment banking, was that a deliberate move or was that, uh, was that a opportunistic mistake? 
Yeah. Um, good question. It was, uh, look, it was probably a combination of both. Uh, I was doing my last formal valuation for the IPO of uh, Paladin Commercial Trust. So Southgate um, down in Melbourne, Greg Paramore and Rod Lever had started a new business um, and I did the valuation for the previous owner. Uh, these guys approached me who I didn't really know back in 1995 and said, look, we're doing a valuation. It's going to be for an IPO of uh, Southgate which was a you know twin tower office building with large retail, massive car park and a hotel. Hotel was outside the float. Uh, and they asked me to present to the uh, prospective investors. Uh, and it was through that that one of the underwriting banks said, you should think about coming into investment banking, um, given your knowledge of real estate and, uh, and the way you marketed that transaction, which ultimately was a successful IPO for Greg um, and Rod, and that was the really probably by a bit of luck, as you said, that, uh, that I got in. And I really thought, well, not sure what you guys do over there, but um, it looked pretty exciting, and that's how it started. Just a, a chance conversation from you know doing that marketing of evaluation for an IPO that someone said, "Have you thought about moving into IB and into the world of you know as I were called back then, Matt, as you recall, listed property trusts." LPT. So it was yeah. quite fortuitous. And, yeah. and I mean, you, you talked a minute ago about um, teamwork, and I guess, and you're right. One of the things that we we consider closely is, is an individual's ability to work within a team. And I guess going hand in hand with that is is culture. Um, and I'm interested to know how you found that move from valuation to investment banking, which can be a very uh, cutthroat, aggressive, competitive environment did you find your experience helped that or was it a big transitional shock yeah look fortunately i didn't have the transitional shock you know if i look at the the juniors who start today straight out of university you know get thrown into an analyst position do very very long hours it's the sort of nature of our industry and that you know there's many industries that have long hours um, but I didn't really have a shock. I guess I was fortunate coming in at a relatively senior level uh, into it and very shortly establishing a pretty sound business where, you know, there was, uh, there was a real need to have competitors in the space. There was one very dominant bank. Uh, and we just came up with good ideas. And I sort of my approach to it was look at the property fundamentals. That's how we should sell it. Whereas a lot of my competitors at the time wanted to make it as easy as possible for the underlying underwriters, not looking after the client. And the biggest IPO of the time was Commonwealth Property Office Fund, where the Commonwealth Bank, you know, Australia's largest bank and you know a top five company in Australia, decided to sell off their direct real estate portfolio of largely office buildings anchored by the Commonwealth Bank. Our approach uh, to the firm I was working with at the time was, well, let's look at the underlying real estate. Let's look at the quality of the covenants and we think we can value it. And it turned out to be much closer to what the cap rate was on that portfolio versus our competitor investment banks that wanted to make it really easy um, and have a high yield. We came in and won, you know, a fledgling business that, uh, that we pitched uh, with a great firm um, the biggest IPO in REIT history at the time. Uh, it was a body blow to my competitors, but it really then set my team up uh, and myself with great credentials um, that we could go and do things that were beneficial to the vendors, not to the purchasers at the time. And there's always that balance, how it trades in the aftermarket. But that then set me on a pathway of doing probably five IPOs in a very short period of time with blue chip quality covenants, you know, from the Commonwealth Bank to West Farmers, Bunnings Warehouse Property Trust. So, you know, 98, 99, then into the 2000s, and I've probably done 15 IPOs since then. So, you know, that came from a deep seated position of knowledge of the real estate fundamentals and our ability to sell that into the investment community. 
I, that's, I was about to, to say something similar. I, I read um, an interview you gave in a restaurant over a glass of Chardonnay, so a rather more fun setting than this, I'm afraid. But uh, um, And the interviewer asked you secrets of your success or something along those lines. And you talked about I, ideas, execution and track record as being the key which I like as a, as, a, as a line, but the reality is you, you got the ideas because of your, your real estate uh, foundation, I think, and, and then you, you overlay that with the investment banking balance sheet and, and knowledge behind you, and um, all of a sudden that's a winning formula. Is that fair? Yeah, that is. It's really it's drawing on those skills. And look, at the end of the day, as, as advisors to our clients, Matt, and you've seen this firsthand given your respective roles, um, we've got to put best ideas forward. You know, our clients are very, very smart people. Um, and we're, we're there to assist them in their role. And if we can't come up with good ideas, then someone else is going to usurp our position. Um, so that's critical. So that knowledge... It's important, and you know, it's, it's it's also as important to say sometimes to our clients not to do something. You know, mm-hmm. I think one of the one of the failings of a lot of advisors in our space is they're always looking to do something, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. We take a very different approach. You know, if, unless it's a smart idea for our clients, then don't pop your head above a parapet and, and doing something that's not seen to be value creating for the client and for the investors. And I think I've always looked at, you know, having a a period of time in research where I dealt with the investing institutions, it's always given me a perspective of, well, let's think about how the investors think about this. Or let's think about this opportunity as it's presented to an investment committee. And I think having the knowledge of that over a long period of time really helps us hone our skills as to what is a sensible idea and what's an idea that will be discarded and put in the bin appropriately. Uh, and we hope we do a lot more of the former. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think history will uh, be kind to you on that one. Um, in terms of seminal moments, sliding door moments, things where things could have gone wrong but they went right or vice versa, are there any things that we can learn from, from your experiences over 25 plus years? Yeah, look, if I look back um, at transactions and deals and market environments, Matt, uh, it's probably the difficult environments that are the, the, sort of the, the most significant. You know, I've got a saying that you don't become a good sailor sailing in smooth seas. You know, I would, I would translate that into... I think some of the best advice that I've given over the years has been during the darkest days, you know, and we've had plenty, you know. I was a valuer still when we had the, you know, the Black Monday stock market crash of October 1987. You know, real estate then went on a great spree of of increasing only to have the most almighty of crashes in late 99, 2000, uh, where we saw office values in, in Melbourne in particular where I was active in valuations, uh, more than halving. Uh, and these were large, you know, newly built assets where it went into a massive oversupply. You know, seeing prime assets go down 60% in a relatively short period of time, I've never forgotten. But, you know, we've got a cohort of youngsters that have never seen property values fall up until recently. And, you know, as we talked about where the emergency rates were set during the peak of COVID at near zero, we are now normalising. You know, we've had 400 basis points of increase in Australia in the most rapid readjustment of interest rates. Similar story in the US, except they've gone up 500 basis points. So during those difficult periods and, you know, no question uh, the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009 um, was one of those moments where, you know, our clients, I, I say we became, you know, investment bankers during that period um, became social workers because our clients had never witnessed, um, you know, debt capital being removed so aggressively by many of the lenders and they had no choice but to do 
uh, emergency capital raisings. And for every major REIT in that 08, 09 period, we did two capital raisings, usually one for ones, that was extremely dilutive because the debt capital um, disappeared. It was a very, very important lesson for all of us that equity capital is permanent, debt capital is temporary. And that temporary debt capital just disappeared during that period um, because it was a liquidity crisis. And sitting with clients during that uh, time was really difficult because they saw their value of their stock go into free fall, in some instances down 90%. Um, so, you know, the confidence just evaporated from these management teams. And we had to come in and shore up their balance sheet. Um, so it was the most, some of the most productive times that uh, we've ever had from a banking perspective. But I think, you know, socially it was some of the most important times where you created lifelong bonds. Uh, and a lot of those clients that we assisted are still our clients today, which is, uh, I think, great testament to sound advice and longevity. Absolutely. And, and you, you, you've touched on um, the fact that we're in a different place now than we were in the GFC, but I think one of the things that comes home whenever I talk about it or think about it is every crisis, if I can call it that, is different. And, um, you know, sadly, we're old enough to have lived through several, be it oil-based or dot-com-based or um, uh, uh, debt-based. Um, you know, we've come on the back of a pandemic, which I, I'm pretty sure I never dreamt might be a thing, um, uh, on the back of geopolitical changes and all sorts of things, all sorts of moving parts, which make this a bit different to any other we've seen. But how do you see that with your crystal ball, how do you see that sort of playing out and how do you see that impacting on the way our industry will, will change going forward? Yeah, look, there's, uh, there is no shortage of cha challenges and cycles that, uh, that we've got to deal with. And you know, I think the normalisation of interest rates at the speed at which it's occurred is certainly a big feature of, of how we're coming to adjust. You know, the pandemic has thrown up something now that, um, that is on everybody's lips and it's, you know, the impact of work from home mm -hmm. uh, and what that, that impact is having on offices. As you can see, well, it's hard to see, but I am sitting in our office here at Morgan Stanley. Me too. Uh, Me too. We're here as well. Yeah, I noticed that, Matt, which is terrific. Yeah, I don't have, but I you don't know, have the banner at home, just so everyone knows. That, that, that only stays in the office. Yeah, well, that's, I'm very pleased you're in the office. It's good for a lot of our clients. Uh, and look, investment banking is very much uh, is very much a work in the office. It was very useful. I mean, technology was incredibly good um, that enabled uh, all of us to work from home during the peak of the pandemic. So, you know, it's definitely got its benefits. Um, I do worry about you know, people that want to work from home permanently um, just from a mental health, social interaction, but it looks like it's structural, not cyclical. Um, so I think that's something our clients uh, are going to have to deal with, particularly our clients that have got you know large portfolios of office buildings. I think there's no question at the margin it's going to have an impact. I think it's going to be a net reduction, uh, but I don't think it's the end of the CBDs. I think, you know, Humans are social beasts. Uh, interaction is incredibly important. Uh, and I know for our junior team members, um, we strongly encourage them to be in the office because we work in a team-based environment. And it's much better for their careers. Um, having said that, one thing that won't change is workplace flexibility. And I think about it, you know, when my wife and I were both, um, you know, working uh, with three young children, uh, it was incredibly challenging, particularly, you know, we moved from Melbourne to Sydney, had no family infrastructure up here. Um, and unless you had um, a nanny or, you know, family support, which didn't exist for us, you know, mornings and evenings were difficult. Now what we've got is a much more flexible workplace environment that is hugely beneficial, particularly for young working families and young couples. Uh, who've both got kids and, and generally you know most of them have got um, professional careers so it's 
It's great that we've got that flexibility, um, but that is going to be a structural change, I think, the work from home phenomenon that, uh, that will definitely have impacts uh, on real estate. Then, you know, we've got what everyone talks about at the moment, which is artificial intelligence and the impact that's going to have. You know, we're just at the beginning of that cycle um, and that's going to be quite momentous, but it's hard to replace people um, with personality that like dealing with people and have got smart ideas to share with them. I'm not, a, I'm not concerned that that's going to get replaced with an AI robot. Yeah, I think um, AI, AI needs um, some harnessing, but treated correctly and used correctly, I would think it has enormous advantages. But at the moment, there's a sense that no one's quite sure how to direct it and how to harness it and how to ensure it doesn't uh, just become an amalgam of old ideas rather than a creation of new ones. Tim, we're, we're heading to the end of our allocated time now. Um, so really just curious as to whether you have any uh, tidbits of advice to up-and-comers looking to get into real estate or real estate investment banking or any permutation of the above um, and how your lessons, the lessons you've learned over your time in the space uh, might be useful for them. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Look, um, I think first and foremost, you've really got to enjoy what you do. So, you know, that goes to uh, team composition. So, you know, don't put a team together. And I often say this, if the team was full of Tim Churches, it would be an abject failure. Uh, but equally, if it was full of pure technicians, it would be an abject failure. What makes teams work is the diversity of skill base. Um, and it's not just diversity of skill base. I think it's difference in personality types. Um, you know, I think we're very focused appropriately on gender diversity. Um, and, you know, we are welcoming of all, uh, of all streams of life um, differences we see as an advantage. So diversity is incredibly important. Um, and above all, you've, as I said, you've got to enjoy yourself. So you've got to make it fun. And I'd say to our juniors, look, pay is really important, but if the culture's not right, pay will not keep you in an organisation. It has to be fun to walk through the door each day. I'm fortunate that I've you know, reached an age where my own children are all working age children. So they're like the young you know, people we have in the office here today. And I often look at them and think, how would I want my three children treated in a workplace environment? And I behave in that manner and I expect our teams to behave in that manner. So that's sort of a guiding light for me. Um, you have to be fair. You know, this is a, this is a well-paid industry. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I've always felt when I've worked at different organisations, my mindset going into those organisations is, what can I do for the firm? And what can I do for the clients? You know, we're, we're there servicing our clients with smart ideas. We've got a team. So always I say to the juniors, think about what you can do uh, for us as an organisation and for our clients. You know, I think there's been a lot creep in um, where it's like, what can you do for me? Um, I don't think that's productive. Um, what we can do for you is provide you with a really safe, and encouraging work environment. But what we'd like out of our team members is smart ideas, a great work ethic, uh, and some and people who enjoy what they're doing. So, you know, that's, um, I, I look at, you know, and I use this quite a lot, I have it written at my desk by Patricia Ireland, uh, a US uh, lawyer, um, you know, where she said, I don't think you'd lead by pessimism and cynicism, you lead uh, with enthusiasm and energy. And, uh, and I think I live my life like that. It's, you know, it's good to be positive, um, not in the face of always bad news. You've got to balance that out. But I think in having that positive energy, uh, I see that as one of my strengths and, and hopefully it's infectious because, you know, people like being around productive, energetic, 
um, people that can deliver outcomes. And, um, and I think that's what's guided me through my career, Matt. That's a fantastic place to end, I think, Tim. Positive, enthusiastic and uh, forward-looking. I really appreciate your time. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Matt. I uh, really appreciate it on your behalf and Ferguson Partners. So uh, thanks for the opportunity.